Shalom. We've been talking about the Crusades, and now I'd like to talk to you about Crusader castles. As I say, where church history intersects with the Holy Land. I've been blessed to travel to Israel on several occasions, and I've visited many of these castles from the south to the north of Israel, and I'd like to share uh, these photos with you uh, to help give you some context and a more visual understanding of the Crusaders' efforts to uh, overtake and defend the Holy Land. Now, this is all bonus material. Do not feel obligated to look at Dr. Butler's vacation photos, right? But I do want to uh, take s at least some of you along on this travel log, and there'll be a bonus announcement at the end. We're looking at Montfort, the mountain fortress in the woods of northern Israel. We'll talk more about it later. But first, I'd like to share some information about the connection between Israel and New Orleans through the Fleur de Lis. This is an image of a contemporary shekel. This is currency in Israel today. Uh, a shekel is worth about 25 cents in American money. But in the Crusader era, this is what a shekel looked like. And so you can see an ancient representation of the lily of Israel. The Crusaders uh, became so fond of this image that when they returned to France, they brought that ideal with them and created the fleur de lis, the flower of the lily. And it became a prominent symbol of France so that today the flag of France is a field of fleur de lis. And of course, the French explorers brought that design to Louisiana uh, when they settled it, and it has now become a symbol of the city of New Orleans. And of course, we're looking at the logo for the New Orleans Saints. So I found that fascinating that there really was a connection between New Orleans that connected to uh, Israel through the Fleur de Lis. All right, let's look now at Apollonia. Apollonia is a fortress. You see it up on a, uh, a hill overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. Here is a map that locates it just north of Tel Aviv, south of Netanya. Apollonia uh, was uh, uh, captured by Baldwin I of Jerusalem in 1101. Remember, he uh, succeeded his brother, uh, uh, Godfrey of Bouillon, and became the king, captured uh, Apollonia. Uh, unfortunately, in 1187, it was recaptured by the Muslims about the same time as the Battle of Hattin. We've talked about that uh, as we talked about the loss of Jerusalem. And, of course, this battle was filmed in the Kingdom of Heaven. In 1191, Richard I, Richard the Lionheart, took it back from Saladin, and it was ruled by the Knights Hospitaller, uh, one of the religious orders of military knights. In 1265, it was destroyed and razed by the Mamluks. We'll see a similar timeline uh, in, other, in the history of other uh, crusader castles. Now, here's a picture of a window of the fortress 
overlooking the Mediterranean Sea to uh, keep watch uh, for a Muslim naval forces. Here is a capital from a pillar. You can see the Crusader cross on it. Here is a broken window that overlooks the Mediterranean Sea. You can see some sailboats out in the distance. A beautiful view, isn't it? And so here's a coastline, and to the north of Apollonia is Netanya, that uh, large uh, beach city. All right, here's a photo of Sweet Thing and Me. We are standing in front of a uh, baker's kiln where they baked bread for the Crusaders. Apollonia, a lovely uh, Crusader castle on the Mediterranean coast. A little further north up the coast is Caesarea Maritima. You can see the map, see Tel Aviv uh, and Netanya. So north of Netanya is uh, Caesarea. It's uh, called Caesarea by the Sea or Caesarea Maritima. Here I am standing on the walkway that approaches the, um, the guardhouse, the entrance to the uh, uh, Crusader Fortress at Caesarea. Now, Caesarea has a colorful history, uh, a history that is layered with different civilizations. In 22 BC, Herod the Great began building a great port city on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, and he named it for his ally, Caesar Augustus. So there are a number of cities named Caesarea. Uh, this is Caesarea of Palestine. Now, afterwards, it was, of course, occupied by the Romans, and then the Byzantines, of course, that's the uh, remnants of the Eastern uh, uh, Empire uh, after the fall of Rome. Muslims overtook it in the 7th century, uh, and then Caesarea was taken by the crusader king Baldwin I in 1101. The crusaders lost it again in 1187 during the advances under Saladin, and then they regained it uh, in 1191 during the Third Crusade. Again, a similar timeline uh, to that observed in our study of Apollonia. The city was finally lost to the Mamluks in 1265 and it was not rebuilt until the modern era but today it is a favorite destination for pilgrims to the Holy Land it is my favorite site on the beautiful Mediterranean Sea it's famous as the site of Herod the Great's palace uh, Paul's trial before Herod Agrippa uh, the Crusader fortress and the beautiful Mediterranean Sea uh, as I have said All right, everyone looks good with the Mediterranean Sea in the background. And in the top right, you see, see me doing my uh, Charlton Heston impression as the waves break on the shore. In the bottom left, uh, many of you may know Dr. Dennis Cole, and he's uh, talking to us about uh, the, the site of Paul's uh, testimony his defense before uh, Herod Agrippa and Bernice the Queen. Uh, Paul, of course, was sent from Caesarea to Rome by ship, and he would have walked down these steps that are part of the remnants of the harbor. Now, you'll see that there's grass uh, there. Uh, an earthquake shifted the shoreline away from what was the harbor. And then uh, this is from... Uh, Herod's Hippodrome on his extensive grounds and uh, the is, Israelis built a little chariot there uh, for the tourists and so there I am with my friend Tom Clore, a former uh, seminary trustee and uh, we are uh, saying charge we are giving Ben-Hur a run for his money. Alright uh, outside the um, 
uh, fortress gate, you see a dry moat. Of course, they didn't have enough water to fill it, but even the dry moat gave it a double wall of protection. And uh, the, uh, the crusaders put uh, lions and bears in there for added defense. Uh, if you follow along that little wooden rail, that'll take you right into this uh, Crusader uh, gateway. You see the beautiful high arches there, uh, a lovely spot, a fun place to visit, Caesarea Maritima. All right, further inland is Nimrod's fortress. This is actually a Muslim uh, fortress. It's built overlooking the Hula Valley. As you see, you can see for a long way. And so uh, castles tended to be built either on the coastline or on high promontories uh, overlooking uh, valleys where they can see from a distance approaching armies. Uh, here is a map of uh, Nimrod's fortress uh, north of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, almost as far north as Mount Hermon, the highest peak in Israel, and as you can see, not far from the uh, border into Syria, north of the Sea of Galilee and uh, northeast from Caesarea. Nimrod's fortress was a Muslim fortress built high above the Hulot Valley in the Golan Heights, uh, built in 1229 by Saladin's nephew for protection against the Sixth Crusade. Now, after Acre fell in 1291, it fell into disuse, uh, no longer needed by the Muslims for defense. Originally, it was named the Castle of the Large Cliff, but uh, it was renamed Nimrod's Fortress by later Druze inhabitants. The Druze religion is a syncretistic religion uh, that uh, includes Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Also some Eastern influence. There is a, uh, a, a, a sizable Druze settlement close to uh, Nimrod's fortress. Uh, there's a little restaurant there where we often stop. Uh, the Druze are famous for their lavne is kind of a goat yogurt and uh, they serve it in pita bread. Uh, if you're ever there, you should try it. Everyone should try it once. I tried it once and I'm so glad I did because now I never have to try it again. Uh, instead, when I go to that restaurant, I always have falafel or shawarma, all right? but. The Druze religion is, uh, is kind of a unique uh, cult. Uh, they have a legendary belief that the Messiah will come to the Druze and the Messiah will be born of a man. Ouch! I cannot even imagine. But the Druze men wear these baggy pants. Uh, do you see uh, in the picture here, the very baggy pants? They're designed so that uh, if a man gives birth to the Messiah, the baby can fall uh, into a protective pouch. All right, that's, uh, that's just an interesting aspect of the Druze religion. All right, and uh, it's interesting to us only because the Druze are settled close to this uh, interesting fortress. Now, uh, the excavation is rather extensive and you can see it goes far beyond where I'm standing on the balcony and then you can see beyond the beautiful Hula Valley. Uh, here's another uh, archway. Uh, this tunnel has the pointed arch, this very characteristic of uh, Crusader era architecture. Here is a, uh, a lion carving. Lions were the symbol of the uh, the Mamluks, and here's just some uh, etched stones. Belvoir, all right, this is a beautiful uh, Crusader castle. 
Uh, you can see it's built of basalt, uh, a volcanic stone. It's, it's quite dark, uh, but it is the best preserved of uh, the Crusader castles in Israel. Here's a map that shows where it is located, far south of uh, Nimrod's uh, fortress. It's south of the Sea of Galilee. It is inland, built up on a, uh, a, a cliff overlooking the Jordan Valley. Belvoir means beautiful view. It also is known as the Star of the Jordan. In 1168, the Knights Hospitaller constructed a concentric castle, that is a fort within a fort, and it protected the Crusader lands from uh, Muslim advances from the east. Now, uh, Belvoir was able to resist the initial attack during the Battle of Hattin, but eventually it fell the next year in 1188. Again, the only fully excavated Crusader castle in Israel. Again, we see uh, an example of a dry moat that surrounds the castle. And here I am standing with my very good friend, uh, Dr. Jim Parker. And you can see these, again, the pointed arches uh, uh, familiar to uh, the Crusader architecture. Now, these windows are called arquebuses. An arquebus is kind of a slit uh, through which a, an archer can aim uh, his arrows, but because of the narrowness of the aperture, he is protected from attackers. Uh, as I said, Belvoir overlooks uh, the Jordan Valley, so here's a picture from uh, the edge, and here's a panoramic view of the, uh, the Valley of Jordan beyond. Here's a couple of features uh, there at the park, uh, basalt uh, capitals from pillars, and then here is my friend Sir Jack Bell, uh, a former uh, seminary trustee, standing next to his suit of armor. Does not look very comfortable, but would be protective. Now, we have another look at Montfort, the mountain fortress. This was uh, built and occupied by the Teutonic Knights, which is yet another religious order of knights, this time from Germany. Uh, here is a map that shows that uh, Montfort is in the northern area of Israel, not on the coast, but certainly in the western quadrant of Israel. Again, it's north of, of uh, Caesarea Maritima. Uh, and uh, so we did not find any Teutonic Knights at Montfort, but here are some Teuton Knights. All right, flashing uh, gang signs uh, at you. All right, here I am standing with uh, Dr. Parker again. This is Stan Watts, and many of you may know Dr. Craig Garrett, who is the Divisional Associate Dean of the Division of Counseling. All right, so that was Montfort. We did not uh, tour uh, the ruins. Uh, we simply looked at them from across the way. You actually have to approach them from a different direction, and it's a 45-minute hike. So we just enjoyed the view from a distance. We were on our way that day to Acker. All right, this was a fantastic sight. Maybe this was my favorite day ever in Israel. I told you that Acre fell in 1291 and the Muslims left it under rubble, uh, not to be settled for another couple of centuries. And then a couple of centuries after that, it was excavated and they discovered this grand hall with the beautiful uh, pillars. Uh, and uh, so they've created a, uh, a park and a place for tourists to visit. And oh my, I was so excited to be there. Look at this corner piece. Do you see the fleur-de-lis? Uh, this is, this shows that the fleur-de-lis was a popular decorative uh, item uh, for the Crusaders. Well, here's a map that shows you 
uh, where it is on the coast. Uh, here's Caesarea, so it's far north of Caesarea, almost to the border uh, between Israel and Lebanon. All right, and here's uh, Dr. Parker again with two cannons excavated from Acre. Uh, Dr. Parker is an Alabama boy, so you really don't want to uh, let him uh, in charge of big guns like that. Fortunately, I don't think they are active. All right, a fun day in Acre. Well, now I want to uh, take us to Jerusalem. All right, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't have a map. I assume you know where Jerusalem is. But this is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is uh, certainly a, a key point of interest for pilgrims to the Holy Land. This is a, uh, this is a complex that encompasses uh, the site of the crucifixion as well as the site of the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, it was founded by Queen Helena, Constantine's mother, uh, and uh, a site was built in uh, 326. All right, now over the centuries, uh, the churches have fallen into disrepair, they've been destroyed, they've been rebuilt, they've been restored, all right? But what we see today is very similar to the Crusader construction uh, in, the, um, in the Middle Ages. You can tell the Crusader style, again, by the pointed arches. Now, the, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher uh, is, uh, is, is, is maintained by three main religions, the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Armenian Apostolic Church. There are three other uh, uh, faith traditions that also are responsible uh, for the church. Well, as you can imagine, uh, they don't always get along, all right? And so uh, in 1757, uh, the, uh, the, the Muslim uh, uh, officer who was in charge of Jerusalem said there would be no more uh, renovations or any changes to the status quo unless all six religions could agree. Well, of course, they never could agree, so nothing has been done. Not quite nothing, but at any rate, uh, uh, everything has remained status quo. Do you notice this ladder? This ladder has been in this spot since 1757. All right, just kind of as a, now it's kind of a joke uh, about the, uh, the, the status quo that was established, goodness, uh, nearly three centuries ago. All right, well, let's go inside to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and visit the site of the crucifixion. Now, because the uh, religious traditions uh, that, uh, that govern the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, because they uh, are accustomed to ornate worship spaces, that's what you find inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And so this is the site of uh, the crucifixion. We have this ornate crucifix with candelabra. We have silver and gold uh, images uh, in the back. There are many friends that I know that travel to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and they're kind of turned off by the religiosity of these displays. And the first time that I was there, back in uh, 2009, uh, oh, it was so crowded. I, I was being jostled about by people who were just, just right up against my shoulders. Fortunately, I was walking with Jim Parker, and as we approached this place, I said, Jim, what is it that I am seeing? And Jim told me that most biblical scholars, himself included, believe that this is the place where Jesus died for our sins upon the cross. Well, about that time, I, as I approached closer, I could see that the uh, floor was inlaid with plexiglass and I actually could look beneath it and see uh, a rock. I could see the 
uh, Mount Calvary. Uh, and I realized that this church was built on top of Mount Calvary, the site of the crucifixion. And so all of a sudden, all of this religious display just faded away. And I was struck by the reality of being in the presence of uh, the place where Jesus was crucified. In front of the crucifix and below is a table and pilgrims can kneel beneath the table and put their hands in that silver socket. If you can look closely, you'll see uh, this little circular socket. You can place your hands in there and you can feel the very rock of Mount Calvary. Well, not far from this place is the empty tomb. Uh, it is a marble chapel that is built on top of the place where allegedly Jesus was, was buried and rose again. Now, this picture was taken in uh, 2009, and since then it has been uh, taken down and rebuilt. All right, there's been a new uh, edicule is the word for this structure, and I've not been there since the new construction. All right, but uh, nonetheless, this kind of gives you an idea again of the ornateness of the display. You go inside and you'll find uh, the place where uh, Jesus' body lay. You can see a little cloth there that says, uh, Christ uh, arose. Here's Jim uh, lighting a candle. All right, so this is the uh, inside of the empty tomb. A beautiful marble chapel that if nothing else commemorates the place of Jesus burial all right now behind this marble chapel is a series of caves Jim showed this to me he said that he first found it when he was looking for a bathroom all right this is how out of the way this is but these are first century caves they're referred to as the caves of Joseph of Arimathea and uh, again, we don't know about the uh, authenticity of this space, but it does give you an idea of what Jesus' burial place might have looked like as you duck your head and go inside where it's very dark. But it is a sacred space. All of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is a sacred space. But there's another space a little further out from the center of town that's known as Gordon's Calvary. It's named after a British officer uh, named Gordon who was uh, uh, in uh, Israel as part of the British occupying force and one day as he was having tea in Jerusalem he looked out and he saw this rocky promontory with these uh, levels of shale and he thought that he saw uh, eyes and a nose and a mouth and it appeared in the shape of a skull to him and so he remembered the scripture that said Jesus was crucified at the place of the skull and so uh, it was thought that perhaps uh, uh, that this was the place that uh, that was being referred to now, uh, a group of British Protestants bought the space next to uh, this Calvary site, this potential Calvary site, uh, but the site itself is still a public space. And so Muslims have built a, a cemetery on top, and the weight of that cemetery is crushing down the shale so that eventually probably the, the 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 appearance of the skull will be taken away uh, but nonetheless the space owned by the British Protestants is called the garden tomb uh, they've done some excavating and found a uh, an aqueduct close by that would be necessary to bring water for a garden so uh, who knows they did find this tomb at this location. Now, 
Uh, the majority of Bible scholars do not consider this to be a candidate for the authentic site of Jesus' burial. Again, it's almost certain that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is built on the correct site. But nonetheless, because British Protestants own this land, they have uh, kept it uh, simple. No religious uh, ornate display here, just a simple sight of a tomb. And so you get a better idea of what Jesus' burial place might indeed have looked like. And so uh, you go inside uh, the tomb and inside there's a door uh, that says, he is not here for he is risen. And I've been inside and I know that the tomb is empty, all right? And uh, so that was quite an experience. Now, I want to reassure you that you do not need to walk inside an empty tomb to know that Jesus is no longer buried. Uh, we know from the Word of God and from the Spirit's witness within that Jesus died for our sins and he rose again uh, from the dead uh, and is alive today, all right? Proving that our sins are forgiven and that we have the assurance of eternal life when we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. But I will say that uh, the trip to uh, the Holy Land and uh, the experience of walking inside an empty tomb is worth the trip. Just one more photo from that site. Uh, the, uh, the caretakers of uh, this site placed a, a round stone and there is a worshiper, a pilgrim, uh, acknowledging, acknowledging that Jesus is not here for he is risen. Now, here is my bonus announcement for you. I want to tell you about Providence Travel Programs. The seminary sponsors several trips to Israel every year often in January, March, May, and November. Now, as of 2022, the cost for a NOBTS or level college student is $995, all right, $1,000. I'm telling you that you will never again see a price that low. Uh, we have uh, donors uh, who, who are uh, sponsoring this they are supplementing the funds that it takes for you to go to the Holy Land because they want very much for you to have this experience it is a life-changing experience for you to travel through the Holy Land where Bible will come alive to you your Bible study will never be the same again now uh, as of 2022, the cost for a non-student is $42.95. So even non-students uh, uh, affairs are subsidized by our donors. And so uh, this cost includes airfare, hotels, entrance into the sites, breakfast and supper each day. And so uh, if you were to go, you'd be responsible only for your daily lunch and other incidentals. I hope that you will pray and look for an opportunity to take advantage of uh, a trip to the Holy Land with uh, Providence Travel Programs. Tours are guided by local experts as well as NOBTS scholars. All right, those who are knowledgeable in uh, biblical studies and even church history. All right, so uh, remember Providence Travel Programs. You can go to ProvidenceTravelPrograms.com or you can find Providence Travel Programs on Facebook. You can send an email to Blanca Phillips at TravelPrograms at NOBTS.edu okay, and ask her, when is the next trip? How can you get signed up? All right, 
once you hear that there is an opportunity you need to sign up as soon as you can because these spots fill up quickly many months in advance all right and so i just encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity uh, i'm so grateful that i've had the opportunity uh, to travel uh, in the holy land and i will assure you that it is life-changing your bible study and preaching will be enhanced uh, by this experience all right so let me just uh, leave you with uh, one more word of shalom and then uh, just uh, some uh, some pictures there of uh, various sites in israel that uh, i visited with my friends even my sweet thing has gone with me all right so shalom everybody we will talk to you another time